So we're continuing our, uh, um, our programme and sort of, I've, I like, I've called it Live in Love because I think this last few weeks that's what we've been learning to practically do, haven't we? So we've got to the passage on Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 6, if you do need to follow it on your Bibles or phones. Judgment and discernment. Um, so mainly this passage is about judgment, actually. And this is actually um, quite a hard, <laughs> hard passage for me to study and deliver because my husband will tell you I'm actually quite... Uh, be, I'm going to be all honest here this morning, as honest as I can. I am a bit of a judgmental person, aren't I? My husband is probably one of the least judgmental people that I know. And, uh, you know, it's funny. God's got a sense of humour. He puts people together that probably contrast each other and balance each other out. So I'm really glad that God... Uh, God gave me Martin to balance myself out a little bit because I can be a bit critical. So this is, you know, when you're preparing sermons, you have to sort of look at yourself as well, don't you? Let's read that um, section. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, um, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Oops, sorry. And why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And then it goes on to say, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. That was quite an interesting collection of verses there together, I think. But the definition of judgment is sort of the ability to make considered decisions or sensible conclusions to judge and pass an opinion on, whether that be good or bad. And we know that in in some areas judgment is good and and we are told that there's times when we have to use our judgment and we're not to set ourselves up in the role of judge over our fellow man this is what this is going to be about you know hands up here if you've um, never been judgmental and I'm really glad to see no hands because it means I'm, I'm in the same company as you and I don't have to be judgmental about you all. <laughs> so that's good. We've all been judgmental. We've all said something. You know, when we walk into a room, um, you know, we sort of think, oh, what are they saying? What are they looking like? I remember when I was a kid and we'd go to the conference, there's been lots of comments passed about who'd got the, which lady was wearing the biggest, most floral hat. And they'd be ju- and it was so big that you couldn't see in, in, past them um, to hear the preacher preach, you know. Uh, or, or, you know, no, but as, as we get older, we sort of, um, we start pulling the worship team to pieces. No need to this morning, is there? You know, but uh, over Sunday dinner, pulling the preacher's sermon to pieces. You know, we all make judgments. And there's, there's times when that's good and times when that's bad. We shouldn't be pulling things apart and being critical. Sometimes you have to make a judgment in a situation, don't you? Whether it's, like good, it's good or bad and what you're going to do about it. So it's, we, we've got to use the right uh, context here. <laughs> And Jesus, uh, we we know that there needs to be a a social law and judgment. That's really important. But this is not the context in use here. Jesus is not describing authority of state, but rather unkind, hypocritical criticism. You know, we're told to judge against false teaching. And we hear, you know, Paul in Galatians 1 talks about the false gospel. He talks about Cephas being confused about some of the doctrine you know, and and mentions these things that we need to be aware of, you know. Myself, I know I'm a little bit cynical, I'm sceptical, and I'm I'm a bit proud, and I'm sarcastic, sarcastic with a big S sometimes, and I've had to learn to manage that, because it can be hurtful if you use it in the wrong context, and I still am working on that, my husband will tell you. As leaders, we're told to correct and rebuke and encourage with great patience and instruction. Um, 2 Timothy tells us that. You know, he says, preach the word and be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So that suggests that if we are looking at 
correcting somebody. It needs to be with humility and patience and, and careful chosen words, doesn't it? So it's interesting. We've got to be, we're, we're thinking about being careful. We've all got a rosy view of ourselves, haven't we? Couldn't possibly be me. I'm a bit of a jaundiced view of others. And we've all said things, haven't we? But this context is talking about how we're called to repeatedly evaluate and choose between good and, and wrong and bad and, and good, good and bad, right and wrong. And we, and we need to work out what it is. And Jesus is rebuking the type of judgmental behavior towards others. And when we have an attitude of superior self-righteousness about it, because it's not helpful. And indeed, if we start judging others, the measure that we deal out, it's telling us that we will be measured with that. I have a really good example of this years ago, and I learned a painful lesson from it. As a young nurse, I was giving a, a bit of a lashing of my tongue down the phone to a professional colleague about something that wasn't happening, and um, felt quite self-righteous about it. But later on, that measure was turned against me when the lady said to me the next day, she was very hurt and disappointed and felt quite upset about not what I'd said, because it was probably sort of, you know, in some aspects right, but it was my tone, my attitude. And she said to me, I thought you were different to all the others. I'm surprised. I, I thought you were different. I, I wasn't expecting that. And you know, that really hit me to the core because I realized that what I'd done, I'd just gone and ruined my testimony. And although I apologized, things were never the same after that. And I remember it clearly. So it was a sharp lesson. And I think, you know, God shows us these lessons sometimes to say, yes, the measure you give out will return to you. You will be measured in the same way. One of my favorite Jane Austen books is Emma, um, who is this, uh, the, the heroine who is the, the rich, privileged, um, slightly imperfect heroine who's on a journey, isn't she? She's trying to match make all her friends and um, she makes judgments and she's a bit crit you know, critical. And uh, one of, I don't know if you've watched the movie adaptation with uh, Jeremy Northam and Gwyneth Paltrow, it's my favorite one. And there's a point where on Box Hill, Emma is a bit um, sarcastic and critical of Miss Bates about her dull examples and dull conversation. And Mr. Knightley, the romantic hero, says to Emma, badly done, Emma, badly done. And it's at that point where there's a change, where she suddenly thinks, oh. And she starts to look at herself and evaluate her behavior. And she suddenly realizes that she actually needs his approval, she wants his approval. And I thought what's interesting here, isn't it, where when we realize we've said something in the wrong place, if we've got a conscience, it will be painful. And it makes us think, oh, I shouldn't have said that like that. I want his approval, Jesus, God. We need his approval, don't we? And I think it's a good example for us. You know, using negative tones can be destructive. As, a Christian, as Christians, we've received Christ's mercy and righteousness. So let us in turn gracefully share that with others instead. Romans 2, chapter 1, verse 3 says, only God is qualified to judge. And Paul says that when we pass judgment, yet do the same thing, we're being hypocrites, aren't they? And, he, and Paul says, Will you escape God's judgment? You know, we can be very self-proud and full of prejudice. I don't know about you, but lots of us in certain um, work areas have to do these, um, these tests sometimes about unconscious bias, don't we? And we find out all the things that we, we didn't know we were prejudiced about. And, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes they might be weighted, I suppose, but we do. We, it starts to examine ourselves, so where we've come from, where our values are, and how we're perceiving or saying things. We don't realize sometimes that we've got prejudice. And we don't know all the faults in our own heart, or, or uh, despite in others. And only God 
knows fully what's in a person's heart. So that's why he is the one who is the overall judge. We don't know everything. God knows. So it's up to him to, 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 to judge. It says in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, he will reveal what is hidden and expose the motives of the heart. So that's why God is qualified to judge. James 2 reminds us that judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And here's one that struck me as well. James 3 verse 1 says, we who teach will be judged more strictly. So when I think about the words I'm going to share today, I have to think, Ooh, am I going to be judged strictly? <laughs> Little run around there. Wouldn't it be good if we could all do that now and again? <laughs> Stretch our legs and have a run around. I've nicked this little illustration from Nicky Gumbel's book um, because it made me laugh. I spy a specky poo, dear Deirdre. <laughs> this illustration of Jesus, it seems a bit of a ridiculous illustration because we can see here, we're talking about this, literally, the Greek translation literally means it's a little speck of sawdust or straw uh, versus a massive beam you know, anybody seen Grand Designs? They have those huge beams in their barns that have got to hold up the whole barn or whatever. They're, they're huge, aren't they? So it's a sort of a, a ridiculous illustration, isn't it? However, it's needful, isn't it? So we've got the speck versus the plank. One commentary suggests this is perhaps a dry wit and the fact that when we remove the plank out of our own eye, we can suddenly see a bit more clearly and see that perhaps that speck was imagined after all. And the fault is perhaps more with the fault finder. So that's interesting, isn't it? It's like when you're teaching others um, and you, you, you too have to live it, it's like, do as I say, not as I do. Mm. You know, if I, when I'm at work, if I, if I, when I'm um, coaching staff and I'm saying, right, we must all wash our hands before we do such and such, and then I march in and don't bother and I leave my dirty apron on or whatever, it's like, I can't tell them what to do if I'm not following my own instruction, because otherwise it will be worth nothing. There are times to speak, and we know that um, Jesus rebuked and corrected. And even in the temple, you know, he rebuked and, and he had righteous anger, didn't he? But if we're going to help others, we need to be able to see more clearly so that we can help our fellow pilgrims and have the correct attitude. And our words are powerful. Um, Andrew Pickham sent us an example last week about the recent parliamentary prayer breakfast where Reverend uh, Les Isaacs was preaching the sermon. He's the founder of um, Street Pastors. And he was talking about min to the ministers um, in Parliament about integrity and their actions. And so much so that politicians went away and thought about that. And one senior politician decided to resign. And, you know, there might have been other agendas, we don't know. I'm not going to be judgmental. <laughs> But the fact that Reverend Isaacs was able to influence and use his words for good to, to influence and to say you must have integrity is really important. And I think it's important that we consider that as well. When Jesus is applying the term hypocrite here, he's actually talking to his followers. We know that he regularly calls, you know, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law hypocrites. Um, in Luke 20, he talks about those teachers of the law. Be warned about those teachers of the law that go around with flowing robes and have lengthy prayers, yet they devour the widows' houses. They will have severe punishment. So we know he talks about that, but on, in this context, with this passage, he's talking to his own his followers about not being showing false piety, not being hypocritical. To be a hypocrite, it's like behaving in a way that suggests you've got one has higher standards or more noble beliefs than is actually the case. So we know that we're not to be God or judge, we're not to be fault finders. 
And Romans 14, verse 13 says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another in case it becomes a stumbling block, i.e. it gets in the way of what's important. And what's important is the truth of the gospel, isn't it? The salvation. Let us not be a stumbling block. Um, Martin's going to laugh at me now for getting this out. This week, I um, was delighted um, and embarrassed to receive an award. I'm just going to get in my pocket. On my, I had, well, I got a new lanyard. <laughs> and I got this badge that's got H on it. And Martin said, oh, is that H for hospital? <laughs> so I said, no, Martin, it's H for honest. Um, and, and we sort of laughed about it and said, and surprise, it's not got a big S for sarcastic, you know. <laughs> And um, to my absolute, complete um, ignorance, I, I didn't know, I don't know how I didn't see all these people appearing in the foyer of my department, I don't know, but I was called out and found this huge crowd of senior uh, managers waiting to give me a, a big bunch of flowers and a, and a badge saying H, because apparently I'd been nominated and won the award for the category of Honest. So I'm trying to set up my Nottingham accent. <laughs> First of all, I had a slight panic for a moment because I thought, honest? Why am I winning an award for honest? Have I inadvertently admitted something and confessed something? You know how you do, anything. Woo. And, uh, and then I thought, well, well, that's lovely. Very nice. And how delighted I am. <laughs> and then, of course, I realised that the award is not just for honesty. It's about, it said, for honesty and integrity and the courage to speak up. And so I thought, ooh, no pressure there then. I've just stood in front of my whole team and a load of patients and a big team of managers and now I have to step up and, and continue to be such a person. So I was feeling slightly panicky about that, like, oh! <laughs> but how nice is that? So that's great, that's all wonderful, but I now I know have to, I have to live by that. I'm glad that perhaps Others have seen that in me, that's good, but I really, really don't want to be, um, I don't want to have some pride here and then fall down because I have to live by that because I will be judged, won't I? And maybe with a more stricter measure now that I've got a badge for it, goodness me. You know, I'm really glad that badges and certificates won't, won't count in heaven. <laughs> oh dear. So we don't want to be a stumbling block, we want to be a good example, don't we, for others? <clears throat> This picture, I was looking for a picture of Miss Piggy and Pearls because I, when I think of pigs and pearls, that's like Miss Piggy, isn't it? But I'm afraid the pictures are a bit too sultry for today, so we've got this comic picture instead. <laughs> oh dear. So this, next, this last few verses say, do not give to dogs what is sacred and do not throw your pearls to pigs. Hmm. Seems a bit stark and shocking after we've just been hearing, you know, about our gentle way of instruction. But this is referring a bit to the custom of, of consecrated food that was holy and only the priests would eat it and it would be unthinkable to give this to wild dogs and animals. So Jesus is saying you wouldn't give the holy food uh, that's for the priests and their families to the dogs and you wouldn't put pearls before the pigs because they wouldn't appreciate what they are. They'd trample on them and then think, oh, that's not food, and they might turn around and tear you to pieces. So it's really talking about wild, it's, a, it's an example, a metaphor for wild or animalistic behavior. So it's referring to those individuals who might have no interest in hearing about the gospel, the precious pearls, so the the pearls are the truth of the gospel, the precious pearls of the gift of salvation, God's salvation. And we've sort of got that sort of impression that if, if giving the gospel to those that will hear it and receive it, um, we sort of hear, don't we, I'm um, just looking at my, my verse here, Matthew 10 verse 14 says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust from your sandals and move on to another town. So it's sort of saying, you know, you're speaking to people of peace or you're preaching the gospel, but if um, individuals turn around and show hostility or ab abuse and mockery and don't want to hear it, then it might be counterproductive. 
So maybe there's a time when you don't pursue giving that gospel at that point. Okay? They might even turn around and get violent and, 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 and demonstrate physical or violent behaviours. So there's quite a stark piece of scripture there. So it's saying, yes, um, give the gospel out, but be aware that there's places where we don't necessarily do that so much. You, you give it, we're not going to hide it. And this is a bit about discernment, praying that God will show us where best to deliver the message of salvation and the gospel, isn't it? So wisdom is the quality of having the experience, the knowledge and good judgment to work out situations. And I would suggest that we have to have humility to apply that. Discernment is the ability to judge well and able to make a keen observation. And when we apply that spiritually, um, it's important to see perhaps where people's lives are at. And as we know, we've already said, only God knows what's hidden in people's hearts. So sometimes we might not see what's going on. We have to ask God for guidance. And we're called to use our wisdom and discerning and to not waste our time on those who really are not going to hear or have made a decision already not to listen. And, it's, and it's, it's, it's quite, it, it happens, it's rare. It doesn't mean we don't talk about the gospel at all or we hide it. None of that is just being, I think it's saying be wise with your time and discern where it's appropriate, okay? Um, a while ago, the leaders were asked to pray um, over somebody's house and um, due to some reasons of, 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 of supernatural activity, and we all went away and prayed about that and, and the leaders were quite happy to, to go and do that. However, it didn't happen actually. Um, I remember praying about it and asking God to show me, um, is, is this the right door to step through? And God said, this is a house of deceit. I saw a picture with a door and above it a label saying house of deceit. And I remember um, mentioning that to the leaders, but of course uh, I prayed, God, if this is not right then, shut the door, don't let us go there. And that appointment got cancelled, we didn't go. So it's about praying and being uh, spiritually wise and discerning. And of course, there might have been a moment when that was supposed to happen, but on this case, it wasn't. We was, and God stopped us. So we have to judge well, don't we? Teaching of the gospel and God's kingdom should be given according to spiritual receptiveness, and we need to discern this, that holy and the holy, valuable things are gifts from God to be given to those who are ready to receive. God's gifts are not open to abuse and mockery, one commentary says. God's gifts are not open to abuse and mockery. And that's actually challenged me this week when we think about some of the things we, we watch and read. It's really important to take that on board, isn't it? And we're told to look out for those that might waste our time or those that are false prophets, and we test them by their fruit, don't we? Galatians 5 tells us about what the the fruit of the spirit looks like and what the fruit of somebody who's not living the right life looks like. So of course we're called to share, to witness and share our good news where it will be heard and we're called to live lives that demonstrate love and grace and forgiveness rather than condemnation in the same way that our Father loved and forgave us. God removed the condemnation from us. So that measure that God has used on us, we in turn use the same measure to others and we forgive them. Also, I think this passage might allude to the fact that we perhaps ought to be open to criticism ourselves sometimes. My husband will tell you I'm not very good at that. <laughs> so we're not to act in a hostile manner like animals but we're to hear it with grace. And I think my husband's going to put me to the test over the next week about that, isn't he? Proverbs 25 Verse 12 says, like an earring of gold or a fine ornament is a rebuke to a listening ear. So let us have listening ears. So we're drawing to a close for practical living. It tells us then, do not condemn others. Jesus' approach to confrontation with sin. So Jesus, when he confronted sin, he would do it face to face. He didn't have a superior attitude and he didn't do it to destroy, but he did it to bring re repentance and restoration. So if we're modeling that, that's what we need to be doing. 
We need to be able to see clearly. So in helping another, we should be like the gentle mother. I don't know about you, but um, if you've had your, your child has got like a little bit of a, either an eyelash that's irritating their eye or a speck of dust, you get your handkerchief out and you... <clears throat> not spitting on it. <laughs> Wipe it away, but with love, because you want to protect your child's eye, don't you? So that's how we should be. Lovingly, clearly, to protect our loved fellow from further harm. And we're called to be wise. As Christians, we should not judge in a self-righteous or hypocritical manner. And as followers of Christ, we're called to evaluate ourselves. And then we might be able to soberly discern if our own life is bearing good fruit, or we might be able to discern if another is a false prophet or a dog, as we know that, <laughs> that alludes to. James chapter 3, verse 17 says, Wisdom from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of good mercy, uh, good fruits, impartial and sincere. So they, if you take nothing else away today, if we act like that, that's not, not so bad, is it? And verse 18 goes on to say, Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. And Philippians 1 verse 9 says, Pray that your love may increase and abound in knowledge and in all spiritual understanding so that you may be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You know, we currently live in a society that believes the church is a bit hypocritical and condemnational, which causes a negative and hostile response sometimes. So we need to be mindful of applying our hearts and minds to these verses that we've just seen. And we need to act with honesty and integrity and a clear conscience and prayerfully consider how to speak out appropriately about the gospel and our biblical values when prompted by the Holy Spirit. So let us do that kindly and with humility. That's our call today, isn't it? I'll sing